authority, to his power, exists in the world. So the Talmud says two things. One thing is the continuation of the story. The same Titus, God decided to punish him. And he, uh, while the ship with all the vessels was leaving uh, Israel on the Mediterranean to go to, uh, to Rome, he, uh, God made a storm. And Titus saw this as a sign uh, that this is God's wrath coming to punish him. Apparently it was in the consciousness that this is a big deal. How could we be destroying the temple of Jerusalem? And he got away with it. And then he feels, uh-oh, God is out to get me now. And the ship is going to capsize. And he says, aha, now I get it. The God of the Jews is power over the seas. Because we know back. We all know from the Old Testament that, you know, God could split the sea, and, uh, you know, he saves Moshe in the water, and so, okay, he's powerful in the water, but not on land. And God heard this, and he said, you think you're powerful? A little mosquito is more powerful than you are. And he calmed down the seas, and he made it so that a little fly fell, flew into Titus's nose, and lived in his brain and started to give him headaches and um, really annoy him. And there was nothing he could do. And for years, till the end of his life, Titus lived with this horrible, horrible headache. As a matter of fact, they say, the Talmud describes it as follows, that uh, when he, uh, he was just in such pain near the palace in Rome where he was living, uh, they started to do construction. And when they started to hammer and bang... The, the fly or the mosquito, whatever it is, stopped to, to, to uh, cause the noise bothered him, the noise interrupted him. He said, ah, wow, I got a solution. So he hired somebody to take a hammer and, and hammer right next to him every day until eventually the fly uh, got used to it too. <laughs> and so he continued, they didn't help him either. They say that when he died, they did a post-mortem What's that called? Uh, Corpus. Yeah, they... they uh, autopsy. autopsy. They did an autopsy, and they found inside his skull a tumor, uh, a fly the size, of, the size of a bird. Wow. The size of a bird. It was so big. It was so big. Anyways, this is uh, just to teach him a little lesson that, you know... Uh, but the question remains, why did God let... And how could it, how could it possibly be that... that this physical Roman general could destroy a holy temple. And the Gemara says, Kim What you have grind, ground into flour to grind, you ground flour that's already been ground. Means you think you came and you took something that was whole and complete, like the kernels of wheat, right? And you turned it into flour. No, you didn't. It was already destroyed. The idea is, <clears throat> did Titus destroy the temple? No, he destroyed sticks and stones. They were already empty. It was no longer the temple. God's presence had left the temple because of the sins of the Jewish people. So Titus didn't really destroy God's holy temple. He destroyed an empty building that was already empty of the, the divine presence. God had, had left. And so... It's flour that's already been ground. That's what you ground up. You didn't grind up anything of significance. You could, you, it would be impossible. There would be no power. Over if God's divine presence was there, how could somebody so impure and, and uh, immoral defeat the, the, the holy and pure God and his temple? Impossible. It must be that it was no longer considered to be a holy and pure temple. And it's already ground up flour. First grinding was done by the Jewish people. And the destruction really was not done by Titus. Fine, he burnt the, the, the building, he, the, he took the vessels, but they were already empty. They were already, uh, already, he was taking something that was already devoid of holiness. And even so, he had to ultimately uh, answer to, for his deeds. And even a tiny little mosquito is greater than the most powerful Roman generals. 
It's an amazing, amazing midrash describing their destruction. Apparently, no one knows the actual moment of death. They they talk about the tumor and there's something in his in his no. This is a this is a Jewish midrash, right? Okay. Well, Chazal knew they lived there in the Rome as well as in Israel. They they uh, they were. But anyways, maybe it's telling us something uh, more spiritual as well. Yeah, but anyways, this, the, the, just a very simple understanding of the Midrash is that ultimately the power is God's and when he chose to destroy the temple, there are, there are you know, it was already, it was a, it's a spiritual downfall. It's not just a question of military might and physical power. And that's similar to what I was starting to say to you about my car. <laughs> That um, I'm sort of happy that whatever bad things had to happen to me, let the bumper soak it up. <laughs> let the car, and it's just damages and uh, just money, and time, and pain. But that's not, you know, could have been much worse. And uh, my neck still hurts a little bit from yesterday, but that's all right. Okay, yeah, you wanted to ask. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I think uh, one of the rabbis, I mean, I spent this before, but I couldn't catch it. What is the significance of the stone of uh, Jerusalem? Ah. Compared to the soil. Right? Mm. Yeah. So it's called the foundation stone, right? The, 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 the bedrock underneath the Temple Mount, on the Mount Moriah. And the tradition tells us that this is uh, the foundation of the world. If the, when the world was created, and it's very interesting, you know, we usually we think about... Um, Okay, so here's the earth, and then here's the mountain, and so we think that the earth grows from the ground up. Like, you know, we have trees here, and they grow, right? Everything grows from the ground up. There's a principle that is obvious, but uh, the Kabbalists speak about it in a more explicit language, and they say, you don't understand. The physical world is the lowest manifestation of the true reality. Uh, the true reality is, of course, God, who is much beyond the physical world. And what happens, is that the Kabbalists described that when the world was created, God had to create something from nothing, nothing uh, in terms of the physical realm. And slowly but surely, there was some kind of a step down from the, you know, ultimate uh, spirituality. There's a step down process through all the levels, each, each level being a little bit more physical, a little bit more connected to uh, matters that, that we can relate to. Like we discern and distinguish the different elements and the different parts of reality. Until finally, finally, at the end of a five-step process, there was the first point of contact. Right? What's that picture with the, the, the finger? It's, uh, what is it? The, is it Michelangelo? Yeah, where is it? In the Sistine Chapel, I believe? No? In the Sistine Chapel, right? Amazing photo, uh, uh, drawing, painting. Um, as a matter of fact, they, right now, if you look at it, it looks like this. The fingers are not touching. Mm -hmm. But they actually did some, some analysis, <clears throat> scans, and they see that earlier versions of the painting, they had them actually touching. It's a fascinating case. What, what is the, the point of contact between godliness, between uh, the ultimate spiritual reality of the world, and the physical world? So our tradition says the first... Point of contact, P-O-C. In, in, in computers, they use point of contact. It was right here. Here we have, this is the Temple Mount. This is the foundation stone. Our tradition says that was also uh, connected. It's a little bit more complicated exactly how to work it out. But the pr principle is the same. Yeah, this is just like Jacob's ladder. That was a ladder between heaven and earth, between the physical reality and, and, and godliness. And that's the significance of the foundation stone. And of course, that's where the Beit HaMikdash is built on top of it. The Beit HaMikdash, you know, as we know, with the, uh, the wide facade 
in front of it, and then the, uh, the building going out this way. Okay, anyways, yeah, my art is not uh, my first uh, skill. In any case, the point is, uh, absolutely, this is um, the house for God in the earth. God's going to dwell in the earth. There has to be some point of contact. Where does God dwell within earth, within gold, silver, stone, wood, which the temple's made of, and animals? Right? This is very much this worldly. Our temple, our altar, candles, animal products, right? Vegetable products, the oil. All of that we use to serve Hashem. So that's the significance of the foundation stone underneath the holiest place of the world. That paradoxically, it's the uh, it's the place. Right? We say it's a holy place. Right? You're not allowed to go there. We spoke about it the other day. You're not allowed to enter that area because it's called holy. You know, be, calling anything holy, anything material, holy is very problematic. Because what do the pagans do? And you take an idol, take a piece of stone or, or wood, and you say, oh, this is God. You're investing godliness into, into matter, into, into <coughs> physical matter. That's a varazara. What's going on here? It's a genius, a beautiful idea. What is the holiest space, physical space, in Judaism? foundation stone. Why? Because essentially it is the closest we have to anti-matter. Essentially what it represents is this. <laughs> right? This is what we celebrate. This is what we, 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 we realize and we proclaim that God is not just in this world, but he encompasses this world in a much greater uh, entity or, or existence which is beyond the physical. And so that's what the holy space in Judaism represents. It's the lack of space. It represents the point of connection which gives a reality and it gives some measure of existence to the physical world. But not that that is God or that physical world, you know, if, if all you have is the physical world, then you say, okay, we have to have a God. We've got, so we worship part of the physical world. But the concept that God is beyond this world, transcendent, not just imminent, is uh, key here. And that's, I think, what's so beautiful about this explanation of the, the, uh, the foundation stone, that it's uh, the height of holiness in this world because it's really the point of contact. It's really the, the first instance of materialization, really, the materialization of godliness in a physical manifestation. Yeah. And they also say, like, like, like in the spiritual, real spiritual realm, like, for instance, for souls yeah. to experience the physical, and especially to do mitzvah, the soul has to be attached to a physical body. But it's also saying like all spiritual matters have also like that kind of point where they can attach to where they say also like right. it's like a, a portal of one a, a vortex a vortex like a, a bridge like you know what you say right 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 listen the the Chabad the uh, the Lubavitch they have twelve verses which they teach the children to recite. One of them is from the Lubavitch Rebbe, uh, his, his forerunners. It comes from the Kabbalah. It says uh, uh, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem wanted to have Dira Betachtonim. He wanted to dwell in the lower realms. Specifically on purpose. It's only here in these realms that we can put on tefillin, that we can do mitzvot, that we can do mitzvot ben adam and then uh, and, and apply and expand that spiritual reality into the lowest, lowest places in the world. Um, he didn't create angels, he created people. People that have uh, all the most animalistic parts to them. And the rest of the physical world as well, that doesn't even have a, a human soul. He created even mosquitoes and flies. 
But they're all here to do His bidding, and Hashem wanted specifically that we should reveal His presence, even in the most lowest worlds, in the most mundane and materialistic uh, spheres of our daily, uh, daily life and, and existence. And we're always trying to become aware, remain, keep ourselves in tune with that interface, with that uh, relation, with those fingers touching, or almost touching, or, or attempting. Like they say in, uh, there's something called, you might have heard, something called Reiki. Reiki is... What is Reiki? The stones are relation no. manipulation of the, the universal energy or something. There's some kind of energy, yeah, I don't believe it, but, but the concept yeah, that, well, there yeah. is, that there is, um, that there is perhaps uh, spiritual energy in the world, I believe is true. That they know how to manipulate it, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't. But, uh, but, it's, but, it, but it's where the false prophets live, right? That's. People like Bilam and stuff. They sure, sure. All sorts of uh, witchcraft and sorcery. Um, they were either just sleight of hand and, and uh, trick tricksters, or they actually tapped into the spiritual energy which exists in the world and were somehow given the gift of being able to manipulate that or connect to it. Uh, I'm not going to get into that argument right now. For sure, there's, there's uh, probably 90% of it is, maybe all of it. I don't know. But... Um, um, there are some traditions that uh, God, if his God, if his spirituality is in everything in the world, maybe there's a way to tap into it. Of course, we are taught. We've got a, we've got our channels: Torah, Mitzvot, study Torah, prayer. This is our, this is our, uh, our methods, our avenues. Not any of those other broken wells and 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 uh, dangerous uh, tr types of. Uh, Tapping into spiritual energy because it could be negative spirituality, it could be definitely uh, it's not um, holy or pure. So we have our methods of, of, of bringing godliness into the world, and we don't have to look elsewhere. <coughs> the Torah and the mitzvah. Okay, but anyways, um, that all comes from my broken car. You see that? That all comes from my broken car. We're learning the laws of Tisha B'Av. We're going to keep going now. We barely started yesterday. The laws of Tisha B'Av. We start at the very beginning on page, chapter 10, on page 189. We're going to see that five things happened <coughs> on Tisha B'Av. We said that five things happened on the 17th of Tammuz. Who remembers what they were? It's been already two weeks. Five things happened on the 17th of Tammuz. Tammuz. Uh, Burning, Apostomus, the, Apostomus, Apostomus burned the Torah. Yeah. They, brought, uh, they went to the temple to bring. Huh? What? What do you have? Yeah, the there was an idol put in the temple. What else? Yeah. yeah. So, you remember well, the last two? Somebody else? What else? Help. Seventeenth of Thomas. What? Breaking of the tablets. Breaking of the tablets. Very good. What else? The wall. Breach the wall. Breach the walls of Jerusalem. Very good. In uh, in the first temple times. And also in the second temple times. So uh, twice, the two temples, the um, the burning of the Torah, the idol. Yeah, they bring the, the say again. They bring they bring the pot inside. Unfortunately, it went inside. Right, right. We 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 uh, we read that midrash. How they uh, every day they would be lowering down. Sacrifice some money and they would be hoisting up a sack an animal for sacrifice and one day they hoisted up a pig and that was the uh the sign of the beginning of the end uh of the uh, reaching towards the destruction of the second temple very good so those are the five of shiva sabatamas but what five things happened on the ninth of av is what we're up to now also the talmud the mishnah tells us of five things that happened on on the on the ninth of August. Take a look. Let's take a look. Okay, uh, Gabriel, read for us, please, page 189. The truth is, I'm going to let you read this section uh, yourselves. And um, quietly, each of you read to yourselves. I want to uh, discuss it with you 
when we get to uh, section 3. So read 1, 2, th and 3. Sections 1, 2, and 3 silently. Page 189 to 193. Okay, and we'll take it up in about uh, seven minutes. Sounds good? Okay. And I'll be right back.
This means that we have two types of fast, full fast and minor fast. Yes. For this we are. No. This might have passed for other the festivals. Yeah. No festivals, thanks. A festival is they enjoy. So I read everything that you so told us to read, yeah. and then I went to read something else. Okay. Uh, what do Karaites do? And they, and they actually fast. Really? Yes, because it's uh, mentioned it's in, in the uh, Yom Yom. Yeah. In Zachariah? No, uh, Yom Yom. Yom Yom. Uh, yeah. Yom Yom. Yom Yom. Let's check. They read the entire book of Job. Job? Whoa. Yeah, from start to finish. I've I did that last year, but uh, oh, that's, so a, that's a long right. one. <laughs> no, chas <laughs> v'chalila. God forbid. No, I'm not connected. But uh, it's one of those the parts of Torah you're allowed to study on to Shabbat. <clears throat> yeah.
Okay, who can tell me? Uh, you ready? You guys finished? Uh, finished uh, one, two, and three, or no? You need oh. another minute? What are you up to? You passed number three? Yes. You're on page 192. Everybody got to 193? Oh, yeah, I got to 193. Perfect. Okay, so let's discuss it a little bit. Who can tell me the difference between, some differences between Tisha B'Av? Ravid, are you all right today? A little bit uh, preoccupied with other things, you're okay? What are the differences between Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur mm. is the happiest day of the year. Happiest day of the year. Right, you're right, it's, it's, it's happy. Why is it happy? Because uh, the names that get written in the Book of Life. Yafa, Yafa, that's the day we got forgiven. We got forgiven for, forgiven for the sin of the golden calf. And the breaking of the tablets happened on the 17th of Tammuz. Ultimately, gets gets rectified. We get the second set of tablets on Yom Kippur. So it's a day of forgiveness. Very joyful to be forgiven. That's uh, for sure. And your Tisha B'Av, by contrast, a sad day. It's a day of mourning. Okay, and, and how does that express itself, that difference? That Yom Kippur is happy and the Tisha B'Av is sad? No prisons, no, no uh, songs, no reading, no nothing. No, I mean, no study. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that expresses joy, that we can study Torah on Yom Kippur, and we don't study Torah on Tisha B'Av. But what else? Because what's the same between Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av? What's the same? The same. What is the same? The length of this is 24 hours, you're right. And also, we don't bear, we don't bear, we don't bear, there's five things are prohibited, both on Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av. Food and drink. Uh, washing. Washing. Anointing. Washing, anointing. Wearing leather shoes and marital relations are all the five that are forbidden on Yom Kippur. We forget on Tisha B'Av. They're the same. So how are they different? So you said we, we can study Torah on Yom Kippur and not on Tisha B'Av. That's good. What else? Amos, Amos, go ahead. Amos, go ahead. We don't greet people and we sit on the floor on the first house. So two things. So greeting also, uh, Gabriel said, very good. Very good that uh, on Tisha B'Av we're not supposed to greet people. We're sort of, we're all morning. And we sit on a low chair. We sit on a low chair. Yom Kippur... We can even sing and dance. We don't need uh, if you're not afraid, because it's it's a day of forgiveness, but it's also a day of judgment. So it's sort of the end of the period of judgment. So sometimes our joy is tempered somewhat by the by the uh, judgment. But you're right. Ultimately, it's a day of forgiveness. We're promised forgiveness. We have to do tshuva. We have to we have to repent for our sins, and that can be to make it a little somber. But ultimately, we're promised that this is a day of forgiveness. Whereas Tisha B'av. It's the day of the destruction, and yes, we have, must sit on the floor. Um, one other thing, Micha, what else? Uh, on Yom Kippur, we have uh, the prohibition of the Melacha. Mm. Uh, good point, but, good point. Uh, Tisha B'Av, mm. well, we're going to discuss exactly well, what... And, and, and Tisha B'Av... Definitely not Doraita, yeah. and, and uh, yes. for the most part, uh, there's no prohibition of the, you know, the 39 categories of work, which we say on Shabbat, you're not allowed to cook and to sew and to write and to, you know, turn on uh, flames and light flames. All that does not apply to Tisha B'Av, 100%. But that doesn't really necessarily express the fact that it's um, joy versus sad. It's just that, you know, it's not a biblical, uh, it's not a biblical holiday, the, the, the Tisha B'Av. Uh, so we don't make up uh, prohibitions. From nothing, it's not. It's not a biblically ordained uh, day of of rest, like the uh, other festivals are, and like the Shabbat is. So good, good. One more, one more, one more uh, differences. Six, six people, Good, very good. You're right. The question is, how sick do you have to be to allow yourself to to eat on Yom Kippur? Really sick. How sick? Uh, hospital. Deadly. Hospital. Deadly. Danger to life. 
Yom Kippur, only if it's going to be danger to, 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 to your, your life. You could actually, you know, cause death. Are, we, are you allowed to eat? Which does happen. People can get dehydrated and really die. So it's a dangerous thing. So, but on Yom Kippur, you need to get to that level of illness where it's a danger to your life. That overrides, just like danger to life overrides Shabbat, overrides Yom Kippur as well. When Tisha B'Av, you don't have to be so sick. The very fact that you're very sick, talk about the definition of how sick you have to be. But even if you're not, there's no danger to your life. If you're very sick, you don't have to fast. The rabbis instituted the fast, and they were lenient, and they said, um, uh, you are not required to, to fast if you're sick. We'll talk about exactly how sick exempts you, uh, but uh, you're right, 100%. The Yom Kippur, it's a different level of sick. That's only danger to life sick. Whereas you have Tisha B'Av, if you're really sick, you can eat and drink. Yeah. So, uh, can you uh, make preparations to break the fast, like prepare the food to break the fast during? It's a good fast? question. Yeah, no, there's no problem to do that uh, even on Yom Kippur. Of course, Yom Kippur you can't cook yeah, exactly. and you can't light a fire, but, but on Tisha B'Av you can. So you can cook, yeah, you can cook. We're going to see that the afternoon of Tisha B'Av, towards the last few hours of the fast, there are some leniencies. There's sort of a, the, the, the intensity of the morning is primarily focused on the night and the, and the morning period. The morning period, we sit on the floor and we recite the keynote. We're going to discuss those special poems which talk about the destruction. <coughs> but once we get to midday, chatzot hayom, the, the, when the sun is directly above us, and the latter half of the day, the afternoon of Tisha B'Av, there are a few leniencies. And we start to talk already about the redemption coming. Tisha B'Av is also the, the, the tradition tells us when Mashiach is born. From the destruction, hopefully the seeds of, of redemption will come. And there's a custom to, to sweep the house, to get ready for Mashiach. And we're allowed already to sit on a regular chair. You don't have to be sitting on the floor. It's only up until midday that we sit on the floor. And so, yeah, there's this, there are some changes. But... Um, is that the mincha? Mm-hmm. Um, midday. Mincha is usually after midday, so sometime. Uh, but even before mincha starts, the minute uh, uh, there are some people that are lenient after they finish the keynote in the day. And the old, the old, the old, the ancient custom is that you recite keynote all morning, four or five hours. There's plenty to 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 study there and to mourn and to to appreciate. But nowadays, a lot of people can't, don't have that concentration. And uh, so they finish it. Sometimes they skip some of the keynote. You only do it for an hour, two hours, three hours tops. But then you, it's not yet midday. So some people are lenient. They say, as many as you, once you finish keynote, that's good enough. But the, the strict halakha is you should only uh, sit on a regular chair after midday. So we're always looking at what time is chatzot? My back is killing me. <laughs> sitting here on the floor, crouching down, what is my, and my, my tochas, my tochas is hurting me, so I need the, the chair, what time is midday, and then midday you can sit on a regular chair, you still, all the other elements of the fast exist, don't think people start to get a little bit lax of the other things, no, you can't take a shower, and you can't anoint yourself, you can't eat and drink, of course, really you're not even allowed to learn Torah, most parts of Torah, Bring joy. We'll talk about that. But um, there are sometimes classes given, but they should be classes that stick to the rules of being those parts of Torah, which are uh, sad. I have no problem giving classes because everybody is so sad when I give classes. Nobody laughs. Nobody is joyful. My classes are so hard and so painful that uh, on Tisha B'Av, that's the best day. I said, yo, you want more pain? Come to my class. I'll give you more pain. <laughs> okay, questions, comments? Yeah, okay, Amos, and then uh, Micha. Yeah. I remember from the last time we discussed that, that some people even lay down, they, they lay down on the bed, on the ground, and they don't like run down. Correct, correct. There, there is a tradition that we have to, one second, Gabriel. Yeah.
One second. One second. We'll do one at a time. So uh, there is a tradition that you should sleep not in the normal, comfortable manner that you sleep every night. Uh, some people actually, uh, well, just like you're not supposed to sit on a high chair, you're not supposed to lay down on a high bed either. So you should put your bed, take your mattress, put it down on the floor. Mm-hmm. Put it low. It should be low, just like the, the well, chair that you sit on. Yeah, actually, they, they speak about, in the laws of Avelut, this is, there's something called loosening the, the ropes. What does that mean? Basically, they had a frame, like uh, the beds in the dorm. You've seen these, these metal frames, and then instead of putting a, a piece of wood on top with a mattress, they would have uh, strings. Strings which were pulled tight, taut, so that you would be lying on these strings. Maybe on top of the strings you'd put some, some, some straw, maybe a mattress if you had a blanket, whatever it is. But the bed itself, other than the frame, was made out of strings. And the person who was Avel, one of the laws, of course, we don't have those kind of beds nowadays, so it's, it's hard to translate it to our beds. The, the law was you have to untie those strings. If you loosen those strings, what happens? The, the middle of the bed that what was the mattress, instead of being high up from the floor, it's now sagging down towards the floor. So some people today, they say we should practice that even though we don't have untying of, of strings because we don't have string bed. Uh, although I did see once in, in India, somebody making up a bed like this with, with uh, very intricate uh, <laughs> method of tying, tying, it, uh, tying strings around the frame. Very beautifully done. I should find it uh, and send it to you. But uh, that's probably what they did in the times of the Talmud or some version of that. But anyway, so they say you should take your mattress and put it low. Other people say we don't actually have to sleep on the floor. Uh, And if you take your mattress to the floor, it's almost as comfortable. The point is you take it down a notch. If you usually sleep with two pillows, you sleep with one pillow. If you usually sleep with with, uh, one pillow, Santi Shabbat, sleep without a pillow. You don't have to go down and put your mattress on the floor is it because it's. Or? This is halacha. It's, 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 it's halacha. It's halacha that you should. Uh, uh, then we're going to see it inside. From the Talmud, everything I was describing now, I said about loosening the, the ropes of the bed, is from the Talmud. We're just trying to translate what that Talmudic construction is to our modern day. We don't have any strings. I loosen the strings. What am I going to undo my shoelaces? I'm not wearing my shoes, anyways. So. <laughs> So we have to change the manner that we sleep, is the principle. How to translate that, it gets, uh, you know, different rabbis have different approaches. Some say it's got to be low down. Other people say the point is it should be a little less comfortable than usual. And um, we're going to see that in uh, coming pages. They, they, they speak about um, sleeping, without a pillow, sleeping without a pillow. What page did you see that already? Did you talk no, about that? No, no. Oh, sorry. You're saying? Yeah. Sleeping without a pillow on a day of uh, on a fast day is a recipe for disaster because you wake up with a headache and then you can't take medicine. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's hard these these uh, morning customs. It's on page two hundred five. We're gonna see it a little bit later when we get to it. They they talk about all the different uh, customs and um, about it, the, the, it's section thirteen, sitting and lying on the ground. But we'll get there. Right now, we're just uh, we're at the beginning basics. The difference is Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av. You wanted to ask something yeah, as well? Yeah, probably this is going to be answered uh, maybe also today, this... tomorrow. Okay. Because my big question is like how to spend uh, Tisha B'Av because I find, find it very hard because you cannot read Torah. Aicha mm-hmm. is the smallest chapter in all the Tanakh. So I was always like, yeah, sitting. Uh, right, that's a good question. I don't know what to do because uh, I know. Actually, uh, it's a good question. It's a good ask, question. Yeah. I'm going to ask something that might help you. Uh, okay. Uh, what happens in uh, like during the, the on the during the day at uh, the what's the mall? Because the, uh, because I'm I'm thinking about going. People sit on low chairs. They don't. So they, many of yeah, them you'll what, see that what, they actually take one of the chairs during the day. People come and they pray. Uh, primarily, you're supposed to mourn for the temple. So reciting the Kinot, other than the book of Eicha, which is only five chapters, we're gonna, I'm going to show you the books of Kinot. There are hundreds of pages. So that could, that could uh, fill a couple of hours. If you're going to go, uh, and if it's in Hebrew and you need to translate it, 
and you go line by line and try to understand all the metaphors and all the, the, the midrashim that are described in the historical context, it could take you all day long, let alone until midday. But um, there are other things you can do if you can only pray for so long or mourn for so long. Uh, we mentioned that there are some sections of Torah that you're allowed to study other than the book of Eicha. You are allowed to study uh, Eo, for example, and uh, the Midrashim, which speak about the destruction of the temple. The laws of mourning, actually, you're allowed to study. Just quite a lot. And um, it's, it's not so much fun. You're right. But many people, because uh, if you're used to studying Torah, like everybody here, you're all scholars, you're in yeshiva, that's what you do for fun, right? So you study Torah of this kind, okay, instead of this book, I'll open up that book. Not the end of the world, but somebody who's not used to studying Torah. I wouldn't say Michael, I put our Michael Ari in that context. Some people, they, they're used to playing on their phones. Or they're used to watching movies or Netflix or something like that. So for them, that's really hard. What are they going to do? To study Torah, you tell them, read Eov. <laughs> they'll read one chapter and they'll pull their hair out. They will, they will, they will, they will, they're not used to that kind of activity. And so we have to come up with, with alternate activity. Because really it's not appropriate to... The point is, uh, we're going to see it later. You're not supposed to remove your consciousness from the destruction. You're supposed to be mourning all day long. So we... Uh, Many, many times we send around lists of links to movies about the destruction, historical dramas and so forth. Or uh, some people say you're allowed to study Musar because ultimately the, what's the point of a morning? There's two reasons we fast. One reason we fast, as we said with all the fasts, is that we do tshuva, to spur us to do tshuva. And the other one is, of course, fasting is an expression of mourning. So the mourning part is very difficult. The introspection, reflection, how to improve my ways, what do I need to work on, that's something you could spend a lot of time on as well. And that's uh, without any book. It's really not a question of study. It's a question of, of self, self-help, working on yourself and your uh, think about what needs fixing in your life. Maybe we and, should start recruiting all psychologists to go to the Western world and just make yeah, exactly. sense. Yeah. Like, it's do a great idea, sure, it's a great idea. Recent years, a lot of the, the, a new custom has developed. People have trouble um, connecting just by reading texts. Mm. They're finding it uh, much more uh, moving if, if you sing. And so there's been this, this sort of um, grassroots movement. You're going to, if you see, you mentioned what happens at the Kotel. Uh, the last few hours of Tisha B'Av, there are going to be groups and groups and groups, hundreds and hundreds of uh, boys and girls, men and women, who are singing. Singing mostly Jewish soul songs. Some of which I taught you last week, Bilvavi Mishkan Evne, remember that? In my heart I will build a temple. Um, many similar songs about Jerusalem, about yearning for God to return to the Jewish people. Many, many slow but meaningful songs. Songs about unity. That's Everybody knows that that's something we have to fix and we have to rectify. There's always room to do tshuva about that. We're always fighting with each other, us Jewish people. <laughs> They say that the temple was destroyed because of unity. Yeah, disunity. That's right. Hatred between the Jewish people. Is the, word, is the, is the word mentioned Hamas? Hamas is, is mentioned by, by the flood in particular, and it's a form of, of, of a sin, which might have to do with like forced, forced uh, theft and uh, things like that. It, they just find it so amusing that that's mm-hmm. the word for our enemies, right? We have this, the enemy terrorist group called Hamas, and Hamas is also in Hebrew. It also means, uh, in Hebrew it means uh, horrible uh, theft and, and thuggery and, and uh, stealing. So it is uh, uh, ironic. Okay, page 191. 191, number three. The prohibition of eating and drinking and the status of sick people and postpartum women. Okay, so the, it lasts 24 hours, not just 12 hours. The bottom, the last paragraph says, we also see that sick people are exempt from fasting on Tisha B'Av. 
and that they need not limit themselves to quantities that are less than a sure of eating and drinking. Only on Yom Kippur, which is mandated by Torah law, which even sick people must observe, must one eat less than a sheer when possible to avoid breaking the fast. On rabbinically instituted fast, however, sick people are completely exempt. Once you reach that level of sick that's defined as sick, you can eat anything you want. Maybe not ice cream, right? Not ice cream, but you can eat anything and you don't have to limit it yourself. But um, several achronim write that it's proper for sick people to be stringent and refrain from eating and drinking on the night of Tisha B'Av so that they participate in the community's pain. We want you to come participate a little bit. No ice cream. Or maybe fasting for a couple of hours, even if you know the doctor says you have to eat after four hours. So fast for three hours. In the morning, though, they may eat and take a day with no limitations. Women within 30 days of childbirth is considered sick because she's not yet sufficiently regained her strength. Therefore, she's exempt from fasting. A woman who's miscarried also, 30 days exemption. Okay, there's more definitions of how sick you have to be. And he says that's in section 7.7. It goes back to the laws of the fast of Shivasar Batamos and the minor fasts, where he describes that somebody who's really <coughs> sick, that is to go lie down, who cannot function, then he doesn't have to fast anymore. And that's the type of question a lot of rabbis get. Before the fast, during the fast, uh, my wife is pregnant, my wife is nursing, I don't feel well, can I eat? So I have to, and this year, there's even more room to be lenient. Why? Because what? No, no. no, but we're talking about the day of Tisha B'Av itself. Because it's on the 10th. It's on the 10th. Yeah. It's not on the 9th. We're fasting on the 10th, not the 9th. It's a delayed fast. And so it has a little bit of a weaker status. So there's even more room to, to be lenient. But you should be healthy. I, I wish and bless every one of you here to not be pregnant on Tisha B'Av. <laughs> Right? Speaking only to men. People uh, at home, maybe, who knows, uh, maybe we have some women. For you, I bless that you should be pregnant. <laughs> but uh, all, the, all the men um, should all, neither be nursing either. Uh, so, but yeah, hopefully you'll, your wives, your wives will be uh, in their childbearing years. And um, this is a very practical question. Okay. Um, The custom is that pregnant and nursing women, even though they're exempt, they start to fast. They try to fast. Many pregnant women can. They can uh, fast, and, but you know, it depends. There's nine months of pregnancy. There's the first trimester, the second, the third trimester, and uh, many women feel worse. The first trimester is vomiting and, and uh, you know, all sorts of... Uh, that can get you dehydrated, and it's much more dangerous to fast. But in the second and third, you may be feeling very good, and if you, you know, uh, you eat enough and drink enough the night, the day before, then uh, it shouldn't make any any uh, harm. If you, if if a woman is able to, she should fast. She should try to fast uh, until she feels ill. If she feels ill, then of course she can eat like everybody else. If they feel so ill that you 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 need to lie down then you're exempt from the fast. But otherwise, even a nursing woman, a nursing woman, uh, a lot of women are, are fearful that if they don't drink for 24 hours, then they'll, they'll lose their milk. Right? The, the breast milk, uh, it really depends on how much the mother eats and drinks. And, and um, the baby may not suffer. Nowadays there's formula. You can give the baby all sorts of uh, other types of supplements, but it depends. There's different medical advice. Some people say there's nothing like mother's breast milk. This is the healthiest thing in the world, and the baby doesn't have to suffer because the mother wants to fast. And so uh, it really uh, depends on the circumstance, but um, there's great evidence to show that if a woman prepares properly, uh, by drinking a lot for the days leading up to the fast, she's able to make it through an entire 24 hours, and um, no, uh, she won't lose her milk, <clears throat> and the baby won't have to suffer. But uh, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. You're playing with fire, and so you have to really take good advice 
and counsel, both with the rabbis and, and doctors, to make sure that you do the right thing. Of course, Yom Kippur is much more stringent than Tisha B'Av. Why? Because well, it's biblical, that's right. Yom Kippur is a biblical fast for Tisha B'Av. With all the severity of Tisha B'Av, it's still rabbinic institution. So in whatever case of doubt, biblical law, we have to try to be strict. For rabbinic law, we could be lenient. Yes, Alice. I have a question. If, uh, if you are doing a job, like in the hospital, or in the army, or police office, or, mm -hmm. or, or you are taking care of someone who is very sick, and you mm. really need to lift him up, right, and, care right. of him, and you need the strength, and then you, 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 by fasting, you can get to the point that you will start to feel like you are not able to fulfill your requirement uh, on the level you should. Right. How, what is this? situation then how we deal with this? Right, it's a good question. So uh, we're going to come up, we're going to speak about working. Really, ideally you shouldn't work. You should not be working on that day. <laughs> but like you said, there are circumstances where somebody has to work and if there's nobody else to do the job, then you have to do it. Like you said, the police um, or the army or, or somebody's a nurse or a doctor, uh, somebody's got to do it. And so if you have non-Jews that can do the job, terrific. But if, if you're on the job, so for the most part, we say you, we don't give you uh, an exemption at the outset. Mm -hmm. You have to try to fast. To try to fast, sure. and then if you start to feel ill, then you're ill and you're exempt. So the regular rules apply. Mm -hmm. But um, someone who, who is uh, you know, on a very important security mission is in the army, and if he doesn't eat, he won't have strength to, you know, complete his mission. Obviously, the mission in the army, it's many times a matter of life and death. And so uh, there's leniencies for, for people on, on duty in that way. But we, usually the, the um, direction is start. Try to fast and see how you feel. And then if you reach the stage where you're ill, so then you're exempt. But we don't give an exemption ahead of time. Uh, unless, unless you're uh, somebody that you know, the doctor says, you're going to get sick, you're going to have to lie down, so then there's room to be lenient, you don't have to actually reach that stage where you're so sick. If you know what's going to happen ahead of time, like, of course, uh, somebody who has diabetes, that's, that's a danger to life, there's no question about that. They have to eat, they have to have their insulin every, uh, you know, few hours, they have to eat and drink to keep, uh, keep a lot of their blood sh uh, sugar level. Uh, on even keel, they're not allowed to fast unless, you know, there are some really special people that have diabetes and they worked it out. There's a way that they can fast, uh, but it's really uh, there. You're playing with fire. Diabetes very can be very dangerous if you if you don't eat. If you, so uh, it's not encouraged, especially on on the rabbinic fasts. Yom Kippur, even Yom Kippur, even Yom Kippur, most diabetes diabetics do not fast because it's just too dangerous. There are some uh, doctors that give very specific instructions about how to make it work. Nowadays, there are people that have a pump. They're always getting the, the insulin. And um, it may be possible, but I don't take responsibility for that. That's uh, the doctor's responsibility. If a diabetic asks me if they have to fast, I say, no, you're not allowed to fast. Uh, unless you get very clear instructions from a doctor about exactly, and you know what you're doing. It's, it's a very uh, fine uh, art to be able to fast when you're a diabetic. So, uh, uh, but you if you're not diabetic, people, sorry, oh, sorry? You met people who fast successfully who are diabetic? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the most uh, simple Jews uh, mm. fast uh, or the, It's a good question. The, the, yeah. Right. It's a good question. They, they, it's, uh, um, we all know that it's been a, a couple hundred years now that many Jews left uh, daily observance of the mitzvot of the Torah. They were drawn out from the Jewish communities to the, to the uh, attractions of secular life or, or uh, assimil they assimilated into the cultures that surrounded them. 
And so many, many Jews do not. Uh, so there's such a thing as religious Jews and non-religious Jews. Jews who are more observant, the Jews who are less observant. It's amazing, though, they, for example, in Israel, they always do surveys. How observant are people? How religious are people? And it's always a political question as well. You know, uh, you know how, who gets more money for the schools? The religious schools or the non-religious schools? And it's got to be, you know, compared to. Anyways, um, they do surveys every once in a while. And almost all the surveys over the course of, now it's been 70 years, even the most secular Jews, they say over 90% of Jews fast on Yom Kippur. They know that Yom Kippur is a day for fasting. They may not go to shul. They may not even know why. They may not even believe in God. But they know a Jew fasts on Yom Kippur. Many people, they, they do believe in God, but they don't really, they're not trained. They don't know the difference between Yom Kippur. But everybody knows that Yom Kippur you fast, and that majority, vast majority, 90, over 90% of Jews fast on Yom Kippur. Tisha B'Av, not the same level. Not at all, not, not, not anywhere close. Also by law, Tisha B'Av, uh, Yom Kippur is a day of rest. It's a day off. There's no work. There's no buses. There's no uh, stores that are open. There's no restaurants. There's no supermarkets. Everything shuts down on Yom Kippur. It's the one day of the year. There's no cars on the road. It became so much that the, everybody knows there's no cars on the road. It becomes a festival of Bikes. bicycles. <laughs> People are riding down the highway on bicycles on Yom Kippur. One day a year. It's fascinating. Um, in any case, Tisha B'Av is not like that. Tisha B'Av, there's no law that you can't go to work, and there's cars, and there's buses. There is a law that the night of Tisha B'Av, there's no theater. And there's no restaurants and pubs and, and dance, dance, uh, dancing uh, uh, salons. They're all closed You have by law because it's the national day of Jewish mourning. It's a little bit of Jewish pride. We're Jewish. This is the Jewish country. So we have to express that. So people know about Tisha B'Av because of the laws. And of course, on the radio, they're going to be marking it with sad songs, maybe. But it's not uh, that everything is closed. Not everything is closed. And uh, so less people fast. I'd say more than just uh, some secular people fast, too. People who are very, very nationalistic, feel connected to the Jewish people's history. They say, wow, this is the Jewish day of, of mourning. And uh, so some people, even if they're not religious, they do fast. But very few. I'd say a majority of the people fasting on Tisha B'Av are, are the religious people. But people know what Tisha B'Av is, at least. Even if they're not fasting a whole day, maybe they, I don't know. Maybe they're not having parties like they are on other nights of the, of the year. So, yeah. The question is, is there some differences between Ashkenazi and Sephardi on Tisha B'Av? Very few. Very few? Very few. Yeah. This very ancient tradition goes way back to the Talmud and the codes and here and there, there's some differences, but uh, very few differences. The bottom line is the same five uh, things, the sitting on the floor, reciting keynote, there is the Torah reading we're going to speak about. All, all this is, is very, very similar. Um, maybe, a, you know, a bottom line, one rabbi who goes, and, you know, a little more lenient, another one a little more stringent, but there's no major divide between this Friday and Ashkenazi. I imagine the biggest difference is that, that the, this, uh, the, the kind of liturgy that is done hmm. for the uh, for Sephardi synagogues uh, is, uh, mirrors what uh, Ashkenazim do on a daily basis because uh, on a daily basis uh, Ashkenazi synagogues are depressing. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, fair, yeah, fair. So the truth is uh, there are many keynotes which, which are recited by the Ashkenazi Jews would have to do with their history in Europe. The Crusades and the Khmelnytsky massacres and the, <laughs> the burning of the Torah in the, the, in the 1300s. And there are many poems which mention Jewish history that happened particularly in Europe. So those are going to be stronger in the Ashkenazi communities, whereas the Sephardi uh, keynote might focus more on the destruction of the temple and the exile from Judah, but not so much on the, you know, the, the Middle Ages because they didn't have the same type of uh, experiences. But uh, for the most part, you know, it's a sad there day are, here and there. 
there are uh, some Sephardic communities, uh, especially the Iberian ones, uh, mm. like Moroccans, Portuguese, etc., uh, that uh, not specifically on uh, the Shabbat, but in in general, uh, do have customs of remembering the the Inquisition itself. Mm. Uh, sure. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. That means that uh, just what you just said, that it's the explanation why the Ashkenazis are more in those nine days, more like uh, uh, taking the seriously the. Day it's day. hard to know exactly why no, customs developed. They extend. They extend the period that's in the Talmud a little bit more limited, and they yeah, extend it for longer. Could be it has to do with the. the the history, historical reasons, yeah. But um, the customs are what they developed. Let's talk about the prohibition of washing. Page 194. Yes. One yeah. thing that you didn't mention. Uh, children. Right. Children, essentially, I think you did mention it, or, or um, we're going to discuss them about each and every prohibition. But you're asking specifically about fasting, right? Yeah. About eating and drinking. So children do not have to fast, of course. Until they're like they sick age. people. They don't have to. They don't have okay. to fast until they're they're of age, until they're adults. So you know, men uh, thirteen, the women uh, twelve. The Talmud says the year before or two years before, we train them to fast a couple of hours. Now, of course, I, I, growing up as a, as a, in a religious family, we all know that there's fasting. So we, you know, like kids, you always want to be big. So, so it becomes a contest. I fasted for three hours. I fasted until 12 o'clock. Oh, yeah, I fasted until 1 o'clock. You, you try to push yourself to be big. But really, halakhically, there's no source for, for that until you're like a year or two before. You're supposed to train the children to get used to it for the next year. But... Uh, little children, there's no, um, there's no fasting involved. If they need the, the, their food to, to grow, and they're not aware of what it means to mourn at, uh, you know, until a much later age. And um, one more thing is that um, the only element that we try to train the children about is not practically that they should need a drink, but they should need a drink ice cream. We were mentioning it before. In other words, you don't give the kids delicacies. You don't have parties with them. You give them food. They need to eat. They, 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 they must eat. Uh, but uh, you don't give them delicacies and make parties with them. They should be it's part of the educational direction that you should know that there are you know, terrible things happening to Jewish people. Even if they don't really understand it yet, at one point they will and they'll get used to the idea that there are some days that are happy, some days that are sad. I have a question, but it's, a bit, it's connected to what you just said, but not to, to this. Can I ask? Sure. It's about the, like, the guys, the, the, the boys, they made the bar mitzvah, and, uh, and they don't, they sometimes, even from the good families, they don't go every church time to the, sh I mean, the good family. <laughs> <Just> the <laughs> father come to show every, every time, that they didn't come for, for Minyan or something. That's, is there something like, they start to go later, or <laughs> how, how is that? Because I think that the, the Talmud says fascinating. I don't know how to think about it. Yes, it's my when, when you become of age, so you have a very you reach a very high level of spirituality because you're obligated in all the mitzvot. Yes. The same time, what wakes up inside you is the negative force of the evil inclination. Sometimes we find that the people, kids growing up, adolescents, they have a strong yetzer hara as well, and especially when it comes to getting up early in the morning. <laughs> to get up early, a child, uh, an adolescent, a teenager, they sleep a lot, and they, they have a hard time getting up in the morning. So there's no official sanction or anything like that. It's just that uh, many kids have trouble. But, uh, and you know, it's a fight. It's a, it's a fight against yourself, against your evil inclination. Um, but there's nothing official. Officially, once the age of 13, you should be participating in minyan, going to shul, putting on tefillin, everything like, an, like you're an adult. But we all know that uh, a 13-year-old is not really so adult yet. I had a rabbi, he said to me, you know, I think the age for bar mitzvah these days should be not 13, but 23. <laughs> Kids grow up so slowly till they actually find maturity. 
it takes a little bit longer. But uh, halachically, we go by 13, and that's what it is. Okay, let's talk about washing. Page 194. Um, Hirsch, will you read for us, please? Any form? Any form of blindfold washing is prohibited on Shabbos, Yom Kippur, and The general instruction, by the way, is not like this. The general instruction is a little more machmir. Can I wash my hands? No. You can't wash your hands. You must wash your hands, but you're not allowed to. So what do you do? No. No. This is an exception. But you have to. So what do you do? On the one hand, you're not allowed to wash. On the other hand, you must. For nitilat yadayim, it's a mitzvah. We say a bracha. When you get up in the morning, you, you must wash nitilat yadayim. So we wash only the bare minimum. You know what the minimum is? Up until your knuckles. Up until, up until here. When you go out of the bathroom, you've got to make sure you wash only up until here. Unless you got dirty. If you have dirt, you know, you got dirty somewhere else, you can, of course, as he said, you wash it. If you um, are aiming during, you're leaving yourself out of the knuckles. Only up to the knuckles. Only up to the knuckles. You shouldn't be touching yourself, but anyways, only up to the knuckles. You wash yourself. In the, unless you got, you got something on you anywhere on the body, you can, you can wash it off as well. That's, that's to get clean. But uh, so, no, we don't wash our hands and we don't wash our face either. What he says here is a very big leaning to usually, but what about, you know, we wake up in the morning, I can't open my eyes, you know, I got the stuff, the, the Sandman comes at night, right? The Sandman comes. So the halacha says is you, you, you wet your hands, of course, for the fingertips, you wet your hands, but they have to dry off a little bit. And so when they're still just a little bit moist, then you can wipe out your eyes and, and you know, uh, wipe your face a little bit. But it should be just moist enough, but not actually wet. So it's a very fine definition. It says it should be uh, moist enough so that if you touch something else, it will become moist, but not wet. It's not actual, uh, you know, liquidy with, with uh, droplets, but... Just moisture. And the moisture is that's the way you clean your, your eyes and your face on Tisha B'Av. But not uh, only if you're really distressed, he says. If you're very sensitive and you can't settle yourself, so then you can wash your face, you wash your face and rinse your face with water. But really the standard uh, approach is we do not wash our face on Tisha B'Av. We do not even wash our hands on Tisha B'Av. Only up to the knuckles. And then we, we rub our eyes. We rub the sand out of our eyes with only moist fingers. Yeah. These knuckles. These. These. This, 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 yeah. It's called the third. The third joint. One, two, three. One, making, two, three. Making a mess all up to not shaking one's hand. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, More than you, you can use soap to get yourself clean if you're dirty. But if you're not dirty, it's just a question of ritual washing. We limit it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what exactly what you're asking. Yeah, we limit it only till here. Okay, next. What about uh, brushing your teeth? No, stop. Ah, so really, uh, you're not supposed to wash. If you're not supposed to wash the outside of your body, you're not supposed to wash the inside of your mouth either. Only in cases of distress. Like we said, some people really. 
I well, don't. Bad I, breath in the morning. It, I'm going to say it right now. I don't understand people that, that brush their teeth before they eat in the morning. Uh, it makes no sense. Well, ask your roommates. <laughs> because bad breath is a phenomenon that when you sleep all night, you get bad breath. And, and she says, one may not rinse one's mouth on Tisha B'Av. Nevertheless, one who will be very distressed if he does not do so, may rinse his mouth and brush his teeth without toothpaste. That's too bad. Or worry that maybe you'll swallow a little bit of the toothpaste. It tastes good. You're not supposed to really be eating anything or tasting anything. Only for a case of Distress. Okay, and Yom Kippur, even that leniency is not allowed. Okay? Um, you can see at the bottom of the page, he says what I told you. If the towel is not so wet, wet that it could moisten one's hand, to the extent that his hand could then moisten something else, that's the definition of, you know, it's not too moist. But... Um, Okay, let's go one more cha- one more section because he talks about washing for the sake of a mitzvah in section six. One may wash one's hand. Uh, Michael, are you read for us? One may wash one's hand for the sake of a mitzvah because such washing is not for the purpose of gaining pleasure. Therefore, Kohanim may wash their hands in preparation for Becha Kohanim. However, one may not immerse in a mitzvah or Tisha Upon awakening in the morning, each person must wash his hands. One second, there's actually there's a one day, there's two days a year. So the mikvah is actually closed. Oh. All around the world. Why? Usually we try to keep the mikvah open. We try to allow a woman to be permitted to her husband, if at all possible. Two days a year, relations are prohibited. Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur. Mm. And so we close the mikvah. Mikvahs are closed. Also, you're not allowed to, to, to bathe. But, you know, you might say, oh, we'll push it so that, you know, we want to allow uh, husbands and wives to get together. It's such a holy mitzvah. But not on Tisha B'Av and not on Yom Kippur. So that's the one day. Actually, use, sometimes they use it for maintenance. You can measure the mikvah to see that it's not leaking. You can mark it and then wait 24 hours and you see if it's gone down. So you can see if it's leaking. We usually do that. Use Tisha B'Av for that because nobody's going in, nobody's going out. It is common to go uh, before uh, Yom Kippur, right? That's in preparation, yes. Yes. There is is such a Uh, custom. Is is, is it the same for Tisha No, no, no. Tisha B'Av is not a holy spiritual day. It's a day of mourning. Yom Kippur, as you mentioned, is even though we have the similar practices, in terms of afflicting ourselves, it's a different, uh, you know, um, attitude. In Kippur, we're getting ready for being forgiven. We're getting for we're purifying ourselves. Mm-hmm. On Tisha B'Av, we're mourning. It's a different, different concept, uh, despite the similarities. Okay, washing one's hands for the sake of a mitzvah. Go ahead, Michael. Upon wakening in the morning. Upon waking in the morning, each person must wash, wash, must wash his hands from the tips of the fingers. To their base because an evil spirit rests on one's hands after a night's sleep and can harm all vices of one's body. In order to remove this spirit, one must wash each hand three times alternately. By the way, we mentioned earlier there's three reasons we do Nitilat Yadayim in the morning. Not only because of this evil spirit, which the Tosfot already said doesn't exist anymore nowadays, where we're Machmir, but there's uh, two other reasons. Who remembers what they were? Why we wash our hands in the morning? It's a ritual like the Kohanim. Good, ritual like the Kohanim. Each and every one of us is like somebody who worshipping in the temple every day. We, we're worshipping God. We must uh, prepare ourselves like a Kohan. And the last reason is? You can say the name of Hashem. Then. No, the bad forces, that was what we said, the evil spirits. Why, why is the third you can, reason? You can say the name of Hashem. That's right, because you might have touched something unclean. When you were sleeping, you might have touched parts of the body where they're unclean, and so you have to wash them off. Anyways, on Tisha B'Av, we've got to get rid of this evil spirit, and we got other reasons as well. We do the three times alternately, but only up until the knuckles. Go ahead, after using the bathroom. After using the bathroom, one shot washes hands again, once on the side of the Hakha, of all night, make like the Adai. Because the saints institute the mitzvah to wash one's hand, one's hands with the Hakha. In preparation for Shahari, even though we usually take care to wash the entire hand, 
on all tissue above one should wash only up to the base of one's finger mm -hmm. thus including the knuckles because technically that is sufficient both preparing for shahari and for removing the evil spirit yes please. yeah go ahead Le Katina, one should wash his hands before every prayer surface throughout the year nevertheless on Tishabahar, one should not wash his hands before praying, because doing so is not obligatory. However, if one touched filthy parts of his body and wants to recite sacred words, he should wash his hands because this washing is for the sake of a mitzvah, not in order to derive pleasure. There is uncertainty regarding the status of one who relieves himself without touching any part of the body, that is usually covered, as here, perhaps he does not need to wash since he did not touch any filth. In order to avoid this uncertainty, when one believes oneself of the Shabbat, it is best to touch a part of the body that is usually <coughs> covered and sweaty. This way, Allah agree that one may wash his hands until the base of one's fingers, including the knuckles, in order to recite the Daraka of Asher Yatsar in a state of cleanliness. I got asked this question in the days of Corona. People were wearing gloves. And they said, do I have to wash Natilat Yadayim when I come out of the bathroom? Yes. I didn't touch anything. I was wearing gloves. My hands didn't get dirty. As a, as a chef, I can tell you that... Those well, gloves get dirty. But exactly. your hands didn't get dirty. The gloves get dirty for sure. So People, it, it, some, it, sometimes it's worse to wear gloves because you don't feel it, that the gloves are dirty, so you, you mm. get to wash them. Right, not good, not good. In any case, uh, technically, so when leaving the bathroom, you may have noticed here in Mahon Mir, they're very uh, nice to us. At, the, at every bathroom, you have a sink with a cup. Mm. Many people use the washing cup when they come out of the bathroom. And that is the custom of some, some uh, communities, some poskim, they say, you should wear, use a washing cup when you come out of the bathroom. I don't. Many rabbis say, using a cup for washing three times on either hand, that's something to do with the evil spirit. When you come out of the bathroom, we only wash to get our hands clean, for cleanliness, for hygiene. And for that, you don't need a cup. You need soap. Yes. <laughs> That's more important. Yes. What's right. what's even happened? if you use the three, even if you do use the cup, make sure to use soap to keep yourself uh, hygienic and keep everybody else not to spreading the germs. So, um, but it's uh, not everybody agrees that coming out of the bathroom you have to wash your hands with a cup. For bread, yes. In the morning, yes. But uh, just when every time you go to the bathroom, as long as you clean your hands, that's kosher. And that's why he raises the question that on Tisha B'Av, maybe we shouldn't wash our hands. If, they're not, if they don't get dirty, we don't have to wash them. Um, but the common custom is we do wash up until the knuckles after going to the bathroom, <coughs> just in case we got dirty or something like well, that. Yes, Hirsch? So, to, just to clarify, soap on Tisha B'Av, even Brian is absolutely just soap. No. If you got dirty and you need soap, you're allowed to use it even on all of your body. Yeah, yeah. If, I mean, like if I come out of the bathroom. Coming out of the bathroom, if, uh, if it's the hygienic thing to do, it's okay. Up until the, up until the knuckles. Up until the knuckles. Up until the, only, only up balls, until the knuckles. Balls. No. no. So only, only this. this on the That's right. Unless you got dirt on it. Unless you got, uh, you know, uh, you missed. Right? <laughs> if, you got, uh, if you got dirty, so then you have to clean yourself, of course, with soap. But if you didn't... Uh, get dirty, so then just up to, to the knuckles. Okay? Other questions? Comments? I know it's kind of sad learning all these, these restrictions. But it's coming up. It's coming up. We've got to get ready. We're, we're doing well. We've got uh, through about uh, 10 pages, another 20 pages to go. But we're going to continue with Zerat Hashem tomorrow. Talk about anointing oneself. Oils, cosmetics, powders, etc. And shoes, we're going to talk about shoes. Rav Malamid is a little bit machmir here on shoes. Well, we'll discuss it tomorrow. A lot of good, good questions coming up.
Unless Beit HaMikdash is built by Sunday. Maybe Mashiach will come. Any day it could happen. Stranger things have happened. So does, it, does the whole temple have to be built? Or does it have to be just beginning to be built? I'm going to ask Mashiach when he comes. And he'll answer that question for us. Okay, Bezat Hashem. Have a good day. Likewise. Yeah.